In this worked example, we're going to look at something falling with drag. So let's imagine that we have a skyscraper and you are a base jumper, one of these people who likes throwing themselves off buildings. Let's imagine you're wearing a wingsuit or something like that and you'll fall vertically down and at the crucial moment you'll deploy your parachute and land safely. Strange sport, but people seem to like it. Now, if there was no atmosphere, then it would be fairly straightforward. It would be projectile motion, which you've done before at school and in previous courses. However, that's actually not at all a realistic approximation in this case. There are many complications that come in here. One is drag, wind resistance. The wind resistance can be approximated by the equation the force due to drag is equal to one-half a drag coefficient, which is just a fudge factor, roughly a half, times your cross-sectional area, which will vary as you flail around as falling, times the density of air, 1.4 kilograms per cubic meter, roughly speaking, times the square of your velocity. It's not a very good approximation, but it'll do. Even that's not enough for complication. In reality, gravity will be weaker up here than down at the bottom, because the gravity depends on distance from the centre of the Earth. And in addition, the density of air will vary. The air is a little less dense at the top of a skyscraper than the bottom. And there are also things like Coriolis force, radiation pressure, and other things like that. Now, it turns out that by using the method we're going to show you now, you can actually deal with all those complexities. But for the moment, let's just deal with the biggest complexity, which is adding some drag in. So now we're not just talking straightforward projectile motion. We're talking about projectile motion with drag, which means instead of a constant downward force of mg, we've now got a downward force of mg. So here's your base jumper jumping down. We'll give them a wingsuit. And as they're falling down at some velocity v, there's going to be a downward force of mg and an upward force of half c a rho v squared. So how does something move into that? So what we've just been doing is the first step. Think about the physics. So we've worked out what physics we're going to consider. We've decided to ignore other factors like the variation in air pressure with height and the variation in gravity with height. We can come back later and add them back in if we want. Um, so we're making the bet that those are not very significant, which in this case turns out to be true, unless you're doing something like jumping off a balloon at very high altitude. But for most skyscrapers, the air pressure isn't that different at the top and the bottom, and the gravity certainly is only far less than 1% difference. Whereas drag is a very big effect, so we do need to worry about that. OK, so that's our first situation. Now we go to our second case situation, which is the limiting cases. So what are the limiting cases here? Well, in this case, there are two fairly straightforward ones. Up when they're at the top, you're falling very slowly for the first fraction of a second. So up there, at the top, you're falling slowly to begin with, not for very long, which means your velocity is low. So that means you can probably neglect that and just worry about this. So in that case, you're just talking about classical projectile motion. And you know how to solve things like that. We know that the uh, velocity equals the initial velocity, which is zero, plus 2as, the distance downwards, or well, the distance equals initial velocity, once again 0, times time, plus a half a t squared, and a acceleration is going to just be minus g. So we know how to deal with things in the first limiting case when you're just starting to fall. But then, as you fall faster and faster, the wind drag will get larger and larger, which leads us to the second limiting case which would be the one at the bottom, which is terminal velocity. 
presumably as you fall, your velocity will get larger and larger, therefore the drag force will get bigger and bigger, and it goes as V squared, so it'll get bigger quite fast, until eventually that drag force is going to balance gravity. In that case, it becomes a statics problem. The drag force upwards balances the gravity downwards, and you're going to fall at a constant speed. So what you'll know then is that the downward force, mg, is equal to the upward force, half C A rho V squared, and if you rearrange that, you come up with the velocity is roughly 2mg over ca rho, which for a base jumper turns out to be about uh, 60 kilometers per hour. If you don't have a wingsuit to increase your area, then it's more like 200 kilometers an hour. Which is why jumping off tall buildings without a parachute or wingsuit is not a good idea. Okay, so we've now got our physics we've thought about, and we've thought about the two limiting cases. Now the question is, how do you go from the first to the second? How long will it take you to reach the terminal velocity? Do you get there very quickly, or would you still be falling like projectile motion by the time you go splat at the bottom? That's what we'll talk about in the next video.